Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Reinout, joined as always by legendary trainer and world class friend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how are you? I'm good. Uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> the pleasure is all mine. Um, I want to talk to you today about the. Um, t uh, the we recently had the 25th anniversary of the Michael Mora Evander Holyfield fight where you won your first heavyweight world title with Michael Mora. And, um, that's why I'm wearing the shirt. The it's shirt, beautiful. 25 years old, it's in good shape. Me, not so. <laughs> it's so good. But the shirt is held up pretty well. You and the shirt look great. The, um, that chapter in your book about training Michael Mora and, and, um, the psychology involved with that, I think really highlights what makes you such a special trainer and commentator and why I think people respect your insight into the sport. And I'd love to cover some of the, um, some of your experiences working with Michael because, again, I, I found it to be fascinating reading about it in your book and kind of reliving it. I remember when it happened, but obviously it was 25 years ago. Can we um, walk through how you came in contact with Michael, how you started working with him, and um, what that experience was like? So maybe start out with how you were introduced to him and sure. the relationship started. Well, first of all, just to touch on something that you – you know, you, you put a finger on. 75% of this business is mental. So if you don't understand that aspect of it, that dimension of it, uh, I don't think you're going to be too successful helping somebody else uh, in in this industry, in this business. Very difficult business. You can know the X's and O's backwards and forwards, uh, but you have to understand the domain that the X's and O's play out in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in a difficult place it's in a uh, harsh environment an unfriendly uncomfortable environment you have to understand that so th that's where it starts but as far as the introduction me and michael was john davimos john davimos was a young guy that his father i believed owned Shearman, Shearman and Lehman. You're a financial guy, so you might, I'm probably saying it wrong, but it was a financial firm, uh, something like that. Shearson and Lehman? Yeah, yeah, something like that. And he wound up selling it, uh, to another firm, a big firm, like, oh no, he wound up selling it to American Express, if I remember, for like a billion dollars, something like that. That's so, right. yeah, is that right? Is yeah. That, and so, John, who was uh, a young guy, and they were around boxing, they were given money to do what they wanted in the field of boxing. And John, I might not be saying this exactly right, but got involved with managing Mora, Michael Mora, who was managed and trained by the great, late Emmanuel Stewart. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm going to skip some things because y you need to. and But he he got involved in his life, him and his brothers. And John was the lead guy and was managing him, and managed him as a light heavyweight, I think, before the heavyweight. Uh, and Michael was an undefeated light heavyweight. Mm -hmm. You know, as I always say, punches are born. They're not made. Michael was a born puncher. And he was a southpaw on top of it. And so, yeah, you had a situation where he was going to move up from light heavyweight, which had never been done successfully before. Michael was the first to do it when he won the heavyweight title eventually, to go from light heavyweight to heavyweight and to win. So they were – John Davimos was involved. There was a Bill Kazersky from Detroit who was the promoter, and – and then the Duvas got involved. Uh, as Emmanuel got out, I, I think he made a deal where he sold some of his contract uh, or the promotional rights, I believe, to Duva. So you got the Duvas now, Dan Duva at the time. Again, God rest his soul. Uh, he's passed away way too young, uh, just like Emmanuel passed away too young. But he was, he was a guy running main events with the Duvas. And... Kazersky was the promoter, and then they brought over to main events, and 
Kuzerski was the local promoter that was involved with Michael throughout his career. And then, like I said, John Davimos. And it got to a place where he became a heavyweight contender. He knocked out Bird Cooper in an unbelievable shooting match where he was on the floor and he came off the floor because Michael had a lot of heart. And he he wound up uh, knocking out Cooper. He got himself in position where he was the number one contender for the heavyweight title, which at that time was owned by Evander Holyfield. And he was... Matter of fact, you know what? I'm saying that incorrectly. At the time, the heavyweight crown was actually controlled and owned by Riddick Bowe. Then mm-hmm. Holyfield beat him. Yep. And then Holyfield had the title by the time we got there. Mm-hmm. So it got to a point in his career where he wasn't training real consistent as heavyweight. There was a lot of emotional turmoil going on where he was going through different trainers, where he was having trouble with Emmanuel, who was almost like a father figure to him. And he was he had no father. He, he was brought up without a father, Michael. He, he came from a little town, uh, even though he was, I believe he was born in Brooklyn, but he was raised in a little town called Manessa, Pennsylvania. He was a football player. He had some problems. He had gotten into some trouble uh, where he knocked out a police officer, I believe, over some. So they had some legal problems where they had to deal with it. There was a lot of turmoil going on. They got got through all that stuff, just like we all have turmoil in our lives, right? Except you. You you never have turmoil in your head, never you, fluctuates. You have no uh, idea the turmoil that well, goes on in I my mean, head. It, it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't show, and your head never gets out of place. But, no, it's good. And so we, they were at, he was at a place where you never know what's going in a, Mar- married couple, you know that old saying, you never know what's going on behind the doors. You never know what's going on. You just see the last, you see them when they're smiling, you see them when they're out to dinner, but you don't see when they go home. And the same thing in anything in life. And in this case, you didn't see, you know, behind the doors with the training. Uh, you didn't see, you just saw them knocking guys out. But there was, it was tumultuous. It was where it was, a lot of times he would just sprint out of the, the ring. He wouldn't finish sparring. Uh, he wouldn't do his road work. He wouldn't train. Uh, so he became a problem child. And they thought he was crazy. A lot of people say he's crazy. He don't care. He doesn't care. He's crazy. He don't care. He doesn't give it that. And, and so, you know, guys aren't going to stay with guys like that. And this was happening for a while. So finally, got to the point where he's the number one contender he's going to fight for the heavyweight title we got to we got to do something and that's where i came in that's where john davenmore's called this young. i was young mm-hmm. you know um at that point i was as young as his shirt at that point you never had a world uh title uh fighter right i you know what i'm trying to remember if i had simon brown yet i had simon brown the world weight champ of the world for five title defenses and I'm trying to remember if that came before or after. I'm sorry. Uh, just like the, the shirt does have a little wear and tear. I have a little wear and tear up in the, uh, the, the higher part of my brain and what's left of it. And I, I think that he was my first champion. But you were a relatively I, I, unknown trainer on the, like, on the global yeah, exactly. scene, yeah, more I mean, or less. I was training fighters a uh, Gleason's gem. I was also training Shannon Briggs, an undefeated heavyweight. Yeah. So I was training a lot of pretty good fighters. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember if I had trained Donnie Lalonde already, uh, and and quite a few other fighters. I think so you had. I, I had already listen. I as a kid, I didn't deserve it, but I I trained the prodigy. I trained Wilfred Benitez, the youngest champion. Of all time, never will be broken. He was 17 years old when he beat Cervantes for the title. Wow. Uh, yeah, I trained him because I was with Customato. And being with Customato, Jim Jacobs uh, was a backer and a partner of Custis. He would send fighters up there and he sent Benitez up there. And I trained him because I was Custis' trainer. Yep. And I was 20 years old, 21 years old, whatever the heck I was. And um, I didn't deserve that. But I was given it because Cus had faith in me and trust in me. And I was with Cus. And uh, if I screwed up, Cus could fix it. <laughs> and, you know, let's be honest here, right? We we always like to talk about that. And 
So I had already trained some pretty good fighters. That's why my name was out there. And uh, I had trained some good fighters. I was known as a young, obviously a young trainer who uh, I started getting known as a, I think as a teacher, someone who could change guys. And, and also as a guy who understood being that I was a disciple of custom models, uh, and that was his forte, I understood the mental terrain. You know, the psychological uh, dimensions of boxing, which I already said is the most important dimensions. So the call came, you know, the call came to me uh, because of all those things. And I think uh, the f it was funny. You, you got to understand, when, when I was with Cus, I was a 19-year-old kid, 18-year-old kid. I, I fought in the gloves up in Catskill, and I won the gloves. And then I had an injury I couldn't fight. Cuss talked me into being a trainer. Cuss was semi-retired, maybe even retired. And he thought I had a gift to teach. He thought I had an ability to teach. He thought I was born to be a teacher. And uh, so he had to sell me on it. Because guess what? There wasn't a lot of pay in being uh, an apprenticing uh, trainer. <laughs> It didn't pay much. Uh, it didn't pay anything, actually. <laughs> so that's not much. And, you know, and Cus, I didn't think of it at the time, but, you know, I was of use to Cus to, mm -hmm. to bring life into a gym that had nobody in it at the time, really. And But but I, he was more helpful to me because... And at the time, just to clarify, you were living at Cus's house, and yeah. I think your dad was helping you with some of the expenses. Uh, and Not like some of them, all of them. <laughs> but but it was a, it was a different time. It was fifty dollars. It was fifty dollars. Uh, was it fifty dollars? Uh, yeah, I think it was fifty dollars a week for room and board up in Gatsco. Yeah, pretty good deal. Yeah, and but it was still it was two hundred dollars a month, and without my father, I can't do it. And I listen. We we don't have time to get into the, to the all of this stuff. But I, I was a screwed up kid. I was Michael Mora without the power, <laughs> and and. <laughs> And well, that's what's shocking to me. If people read the book and hear about the, your, the early part of your but life I had to prior to meeting, a little earlier. prior to meeting Cuss, like you said, we don't have time to go over all of it. But the book is, if if you're a fan of Teddy's, the book is so fascinating, it, with, filled with stuff that I had no idea about. I, I hope not. I, <laughs> I had, I had gotten myself in trouble. I had a special father who was a doctor. And um, I had a, he was a special man. He founded two hospitals on Staten Island for one reason. Way before everyone talked about Obamacare, or, uh, there were no HMOs back in those days. You went, you you wound up with no medical help or a clinic. Uh, you know, you're lucky if you got treated, or you had a doctor that like this guy. And um, he built two hospitals so. Poor people could have a place to get proper hospital care. That's why he did it. You know, the people that had money footed the bills, don't get me wrong. The rest of it, he, you know, he absorbed whatever he had to absorb. He did a house course till he was 80 for free. Again, he went into the projects. He went wherever the call was, where the call, where the, where the loudest call was, and um, the most desperate call was. Because, you know, uh, that's... The, the others could find other options in other places. Uh, there were no options and places for these people that my father took care of. And the problem with me being the stupid kid I was that had this great father, I, Mickey Mano, Willie Mays, you know, Ali. Ali was my uh, closest thing to one of my heroes. But... I would never be able to articulate it in a way where I could connect hero with one of those people. I, I looked, I, I was fascinated as a kid by them. But if I if I knew how to connect that, the only hero I, I think heroes quietly lead you. Hero, you don't even know they're heroes. Yeah, they just. It's kind of like you don't know a magnet is pulling something until you're close to it. Mm -hmm. And then you're there, and it's like, oh, something pulled me here. I, I, 
I didn't know, but my father was my hero. And, you know, I watched this man. I watched every day. He left very early in the morning. Uh, he barely ate. He would cut up some fruit so to sustain himself during the day. You know, he was ahead of himself with all that stuff before you started eating fruit and vegetables <laughs> and everything else, right? And he, you know, he would, no matter how he felt, he did his job. He taught me how to be a pro when I wasn't old enough to learn how to be a pro. But I, I found out the greatest teacher was just seeing. It wasn't hearing. It was just seeing. And there is osmosis. Yeah. It does seep in. It does somehow find its find its way. You know, you leave water alone and it's, it's going to get into places. Well, you know, um, if you, if you, if you see action of a person doing things on a regular basis that is special, it's going to get somewhere. I'm it's always, wind up, it's going to wind up somewhere. And I, you know, I was, I was, following this man without realizing I was following him and learning things without knowing I was learning. Like yeah. I always talk about one time I walked in his room, I shouldn't have, I didn't knock on the door and I walked in and there was a mirror over here and he was over there and so I could see through the mirror and I saw him, this is a man who was the rock of Gibraltar and I I thought he was 42 when he was like 80. Yeah. Like, like I didn't realize that 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 he aged until he was in his 60s. I'm, I'm serious as a yeah. kid because I always thought he was 42. Yeah. And I don't know where I came up with that number. And so when I looked in, I walked in, I looked, and he was bent over in pain. And he was wearing a harness. I didn't know what it was. It was a strap. It was a leather uh, thrust that, that kept his intestines in place because he had a double hernia that he had built up over 30 years. He never took care of. He got in medical school when he saved the life of an obese lady who had a heart attack in, at, in front of NYU. That's where he went to medical school on the street, picked her up, saved her and, and got a hernia and then never took care of it because he didn't have time to take off because he was taking care of patients and putting himself second, doing what a pro does. Right. Yeah. And it, it grew, and it was before lasers and before the stuff that we have today, and and was sticking out, and it was painful, it was debilitating, but he never showed it. And right there, like lesson, uh, you know how to be a pro. I didn't uh, articulate that. I didn't connect it. I get it, but you know how to do what you got to do, and don't let other things interfere with that. Find a way. Find a way or find excuses. Have a reason or have an excuse not to have a reason. And and all these, you know, later on you learn the words that connect with the with the action of it. And so he got mad, you know, because I didn't knock. And the second he realized that I, you know, was seeing something, he was fine. He 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 he, he obliterated it. You can obliterate pain, by the way. You can obliterate those things. Yeah. If you have a reason and a care to do that. Mm -hmm. If your care and reason is greater than than the pain. And his reason and care was always greater than the pain. Always. And it was always greater than him. And I so I'm I'm like confused. I'm just a camera, you know, and I gotta get out of there now. And but it it was there. It was there. It was you know somewhere. And then, like the idiot that I was, the one thing that was missing was I wanted this guy around, but he was never around because he had a job to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm a selfish son of a bee that we all can be. And and I'm not thinking of that. And I'm thinking what I instead of what I have, what I don't have, mm -hmm. right? And. So I don't see him around, but where is he? The only way I can be with him, I go on house calls. So I go on house calls. Mm -hmm. So he was the only doctor that allowed the entrance service to call him whenever a patient called. There was entrance service. There's no papers. Yeah, yeah. and, and call him. So you guess what? One in the morning, 12 at night, I hear the phone. I was at the end of the hall. I knew what the call was. It was, it was a patient that was sick, that the other doctors would never get that call, ever. Mm -hmm. And the patient would have to go to the emergency room, or wherever, or wait. And 
I knew what was next. He was coming out of his, take about 15 minutes, he was coming out of his room with his pants on, with the pajamas sticking out at the bottom. <laughs> and and this little nine-year-old kid, 10-year-old kid, was down there at the hallway waiting. And he'd come out and say, what are you doing? I'm going with you. No, you're not. You go back, you know, go back in your room. No, I'm going with you. You're not going with me. Go back in your room. Every once in a while, I'd be able to negotiate where I could go, depending, you know, yeah. on circumstances. And so, and then that's, that's the only way I could be around them. And then I got, when I got to be, you know, at a certain age, 15, whatever, 16, I got screwed up. I went into the stupid stuff and the streets and got lost. And I realized as I got older what it was that as a kid, I innately understood that the people that got my father's attention were the guys, the people that was messed up, that yeah. had problems, yeah. that were fractured, that were hurt. So I go get, I figure I want to be around them more. So I got a brilliant idea. I'll get hurt. I, I'll get hurt. I, I'll get messed up. I'll get screwed up. I get, I get all those things, and I, I, I have him. So I was in the streets fighting every day, doing all, and I wound up with this. We're not going to go into the whole thing, mm -hmm. you know. Fighting, some people don't fight with their hands. But that taught me something later on. I didn't want that lesson. It's amazing insight that you have the ability to recognize this in hindsight. A lot of people never can understand why they're doing what they're doing. But I, I found out afterwards, even with this, well, you know, there was like, it was, I don't know, five, six against one, whatever. And, and I'm fighting and all of a sudden someone has to cut me. You're going to win. I mean, I was doing, you know, doing what I got to do. And maybe you're going to take a few punches. But... The numbers will win. You will win. But no, no. The human beings being weak that they are and being powerful as they are, depending on your choice, right? Mm -hmm. Your choice. Mm -hmm. It's always your choice. Yep. You know, it's not a cosmic thing going on. It's your choice. And then all of a sudden, you know, someone pulls out, you know, flicks out a blade. And no. And what did it teach me later as a trainer? That fear knows no boundaries and not controlled will make the strongest the weakest that that no matter what the odds are no matter how you're supposed to be in a position to be the favorite to be the front runner to that everything's going to be okay it doesn't matter fear will show it's powerful and sometimes sometimes ugly head and it, if you allow it to if you allow it to and don't understand it and don't don't say no I'm the boss it will take you to some pretty damn bad places but it's your choice it's your freaking choice how the hell did I learn that same thing I learned things about it was there it was just put there but it came out later and and I understood it and so you know I I wound up and then my father, later on, I got in trouble for all these places that I went to that I just described. I got in trouble. I was facing jail. It was a serious thing. And uh, there was no reason for it. I, I had no reason to be doing those things except what I just said. Mm -hmm. And it's no excuse. It's no freaking excuse. It's no excuse. But... I, I guess at the end of the day, as long as you get to the place that you, you want to get to, that's the right place, uh, the travels might be uh, a, a little less than, uh, you know, less than conventional, but at least you get to that place. I finally got to a good place. Yeah. I finally got to a good place. And part of it was going up to Catskill, that during the tr troubled times, I had a friend, Kevin Rooney, who had just won a gold gloves. He had gone up to Catskill four months earlier with Cuz to fight to turn pro. That was the idea, to turn pro with, the, with this great, great master named Cuz Tomato who had Floyd Patterson and Jose Torres, and he was retired, basically, semi-retired, whatever. And he's up in a Catskill, and, um, and 
you know, Kevin's up there, and Kevin said, Cuz, can my friend come up? He's waiting trial, and I want to keep him out of trouble. And he's, he's a fighter, and this and that. And I went up there, I went, went in the gloves, I won the gloves. Uh, I couldn't fight anymore. Cuz got to like me, and uh, I, be, I became Cuz's guy. Yeah. And he talked me into being a trainer. And there was more to it, but I had that background. Mm-hmm. And now I'm down, obviously, down in New York, living with my family. I had. I had children, a beautiful wife, two great children, and I get this phone call. And and I've already been, like I said, I trained Benitez up there, you know, because I was with Cus. Mm -hmm. I trained him for the Palomino fight. Uh, Outdoors in Puerto Rico, the fight was when Benitez won the welterweight title. I mean, I was given, again, I was given the, uh, the, I was given the keys to paradise. I was was given the keys to the Lamborghini and, and, and I didn't even have a learner's permit. (laughs) But, but Cus believed in me. Yeah. And that said, you have an ability to teach. And, uh, all of a sudden things started, I, I found out that I had greater sense of responsibility for others than myself. That, that, that I cared, I cared about others, where I could make myself do things that were completely disciplined, completely, you know, controlled. Um, I didn't want to not. F- I didn't want to fill my responsibilities to others when I had a commitment to others. Yeah. And and that cause saw that. And I started training these kids. I started training the pros. I started training, all, and then you know. Somebody named uh, Mike Tyson came along, who I trained for four years, and that took us down another trip, which we don't have time for. And I wound up back in New York, but I was already to the answer to your question. Uh, we had to take a few side streets to get there, but I was training fighters for a while already. Yeah, and and I and cause when I got this chance, this phone call to train Michael Moore. There was a couple of things went through my head. One was, I'm I'm in a luncheonette in a coffee shop on Main Street in Catskill, with Cuss, and I had a fight a tr- fight on ESPN a couple of nights earlier. Uh, it was Kevin Rooney actually, and uh, they had talked about me on TV. I'm a young trainer, yeah. talking about me and Cuss's protege, and so the owner of the coffee shop, I think I still remember his name, I think it was Werner, it was a German guy, and he comes over, and Cus is a master psychologist, of course, and the guy comes over, and he he says, um, you know, I saw you on TV, and he starts talking, and, you know, it's good to have you in here, and being you know, all nice, and I'm going to pick up your check. And, and but Cus being Cus couldn't leave it at that. Cus was like, he used to call me the young master. Yeah. Because he had to give me something. He wasn't giving me money. Yeah. <laughs> so he had to give me something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, that is, let me tell you something. That is much more powerful than money. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, my God. And, and he knew. And so he said, this is the young master. He said, he's going to come back here. He's going to buy your shop. When he's got heavyweight champ, he didn't say lightweight champ. He didn't say featherweight champ. He didn't say junior, you know, strawweight champ. He said heavyweight champ. And I'm like, yeah. Hey, he's going to come back. He's going to buy your shop. And then a little bit of me, you know, a little bit of the, the proper part of me, you know, once I got over that, over the, you know, uh, you know, I, I was like, it, it would have, it would have been nice because if you just if we just said thank you, maybe <laughs> because I didn't have the money to pay for the cheeseburger and the vanilla shake. <laughs> to be quite honest, but he made me forget about that. Yeah, cuz made me forget about what I didn't have, and think about what I would have. That's that's magic. Yeah, that's magic, baby. That 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 is, and so. I'm 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 gonna have to have you. So now, fast forward to what you're talking about. When when I get to go, I said, "This is, this is this is the final piece of the puzzle." This is that. Cause said, "I'm gonna have to have you." And I'm I'm a young you know I'm young still, and I'm gonna ha- I'm gonna have to have you. Champ and it, it, like it made sense. Mm. It made sense. So anyway, I wouldn't say yes to training him. The first thing was I would have to meet him. 
Yeah. But but I, I did my homework. I did my due diligence. That's what you do. And Cus always said the first sign of a pro is preparation. And so I did all my preparation. I knew that the guy was, listen, I'm going to not be gentle with him. I love Michael and I still love him, but he was a head case. Yeah. You know, he's a psychopath, you know, but uh, was I Dr. Brothers? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I just told you some stuff here. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I wasn't exactly Cleaver the Beaver. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, <laughs> so who the hell am I to point fingers, you know? Yeah. I just got to understand it. And here's the interesting thing is I had a course in understanding in my life already that I didn't even know got me ready for this. Yeah. A full course already. And so, you know, I, everyone said when, when I first got Lou Duva, God bless him, good friend, you know, God bless, God rest his soul, a tremendous boxing guy. They, they all, they all said, listen, he's nuts, he's crazy. And he's lazy. He doesn't care. And so I got the stories. I started hearing all the stories. And while they were just, he, he would jump out of the ring. He wouldn't train. He, he would, he would make a scene, you know, uh, he'd be all this stuff, uh, you know, and then he'd go in and knock a guy out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, thank God for that eraser, right? And so, all this stuff, and now, so they're painting this picture. And when I'm hearing a guy who don't care, a guy who's crazy, a guy who's lazy, all of a sudden I'm putting this, it's all coming in, I'm deciphering this in my head. You know, I'm, I'm, it's a Morse code for me. And it, it's, it's, oh, I can't, but I hear it. I know what that is. Yeah. I, that's that's not jibber jabber. That that's telling me. I know exactly what that is, and so while they're seeing all those things, I'm I'm seeing a guy scared. I'm seeing a guy looking for something. I'm seeing a guy searching for something. I'm seeing a guy willing to hurt himself to find that. I'm seeing a guy that. Wants something to believe in. I'm fine. He's trying to find something. I see me. <laughs> I said it earlier. With, with, without, <laughs> without the Southpaw stands in the power. But, you know, and, and all the great things that he had that I didn't have. But I saw a lost guy. Mm -hmm. And I found myself... Maybe I could help him find himself. Maybe I'm supposed to be training this guy. Maybe this is the guy I'm supposed to. So I go and I meet him. And, you know, he, again, he's acting like you don't care. Is this the first meeting is when he showed up with his son? Yeah. That's part to me that son. you see right through that, though, that he brought the son almost like a security blanket yeah, that he a, could turn and, yeah. you know, basically think out loud by speaking to the son. And you kind of saw right through that. And it, I would never have picked up on that myself, but when you're saying it, I'm like, that makes perfect sense. By having the son there, it's like a distraction. Whenever he needs to get out of the conversation, he can turn his attention to yeah. the son. And then you're right. And then he could also act like, I don't care. Where does that help him? Where does that benefit him? We, we're always looking for help in life. We are. We're protective creatures. We're not, the, the greatest thing we know how to do is survive. We have to learn how to win. We have to learn how to live. But we all know how to survive. It's a mechanism that's just, it's, it's, it's automatic. It's there. It has to be there to keep us alive. You know? I mean, so he's, he's acting like he don't care. And I'm thinking, because, you know, I, he's looking at the sun like, I don't care what this is. But he's listening to every word I'm saying. And, and I'm saying he, he's protecting himself. Because if he don't care, nobody can hurt him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if he don't train, and people know he don't train, instead of saying he's no good when he loses, which is always a possibility, right? You know? Yeah, if, if Instead of people saying when he loses, or if he loses, that he's no good, 
they'll say he don't care. And that don't hurt. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't care, nobody can hurt me. I didn't care. If I cared, you could hurt me. Because then you say that I lost something that I cared about. But I didn't give a shit about it. Excuse my language. I didn't give a crap about it. So, eh, it don't hurt. And so he was brilliant. He was a genius at surviving. This is the part that really, that really touched me because I do that. I do that with my wife. I'll tell her all the time. Do you think I care about this? Go on. And that's go on, exactly go on. what I'm trying to do is. Go on. No, no, because I'm, we, we need to get to the bottom of this. That's ex yes. well, I do it. I do it with everything. She'll say, why are you doing that? And I'm like, you think I care what they think of me? When the truth is I'm just looking for an excuse to pretend I don't care, but I do care. Of course. Yeah. If I didn't care, I wouldn't even waste my time to say I don't care. We all care. Exactly. We all care. So I recognize that. So instead of seeing all these other things, I saw that. Mm -hmm. And I remember a story that the brilliant real master, Custom Model, told me about a fighter, a real fighter, that went on to win a real title, a world title, when there was only 12 titles, or whatever it was, but it was none of these extra titles. So during the real heyday of the game that Cus was uh, had, was involved with, told me a story. It's a great story. He told me that this guy had no confidence, insecure, all these things. He was Michael Moore before Michael Moore, but at a different weight class. And that whenever he had a fight on, this guy would go and party. He would go out. and he. But here's the key. Some of these guys do that. Excuse me, my back. Some of these guys do that, and they hide it. He made sure everyone knew he was partying. He made sure everyone knew he wasn't training. He made sure everybody knew that he was breaking all the rules and committing all these sins. He was building his alibi. Yep. And he was getting his parachute ready to pull when, when it was time to jump. And so nobody else knew this. So Cus knew it, and so he would go out. He would he he wouldn't he would go out and he would he he would party and he let everybody know that he was partying and he was supposed to be training. Hey, you're supposed to be training. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. He would sneak into the gym at night and train hmm. because he knew he was going to fight. It, it was the alternate currents. Electricity, positive and negative, banging into each other, back and forth. The battle going on. It was World War II going on there, back and forth. That he wanted to win. He wanted to be able to be special and great and all these things, but he he didn't know how. Because the instinct to survive was there, and saying. No, I want you to survive. And it's not just physical survival, it's emotional survival. I want you to survive. So we'll make excuses. So if we fail, we can survive. We can emotionally survive. So, but but he's training like an animal at night. When all, so Cus, I'm sure, added to the story a little bit. Yeah. You know, to make it yeah, yeah. what it had to be. Because Cus is a teacher. And you need stuff to teach. So... Cus says one day the guy the fighter he's leaving the gym and as he's leaving the gym an old man comes in I think it was Cus hmm. and the old man says I know what you're up to what are you talking about old man you don't know nothing kind of like walking out of a place after you robbed it and somebody yells from the project I saw I, I know you yeah you don't know me he <laughs> having a talk. Now I do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you don't know me. I know you. I know who you are. And so he, he's coming out of the gym. The old man says, I know what you're doing. You don't know nothing, old man. I ain't doing nothing. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're a fighter. You're the fighter. You're training. You're acting like you don't care and you care. You're training because you're afraid to lose. And he goes, you don't know nothing, old man. I ain't training. I know. And you know what? I'm going to let everyone know. So you better make up your mind. You're either going to make up your mind to win 
or to continue to make up your mind to have excuses to lose. But I'm letting it out of the bag. It ain't going to be a secret no more. Now the guy had no, he had nowhere to, to go. He, he either has to quit or he's got to face up. He, something's forcing him to face up. Well, I told this story to Michael that first time I met him. Mm. That's the story I told him. And I was call, I was, there was no doubt in my mind or his mind who that fighter was. It yeah. was him. Yeah. It was him. And I made sure it was him because it needed to be him. And he acted like he wasn't listening and then he messed up. After acting like he wasn't listening, he says, so what happened? Did he win? <laughs> <laughs> did he did he win? I, I said, uh, that's to be found out. <laughs> that's to be found out. What do you mean? No, I, did he win? That's to be found out. And uh, I had him. Gus was right. I did have a little bit of an inkling of how to teach. And um, and after that, uh, he went back. You know, I said, I don't know if I'm going to train this guy. And he went back. He went back to. Uh, he went back to Davimos and them, from what I understand. And he says, you got to get me this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you gotta, I'll do whatever he says. You know, I mean, basically, uh, yeah. uh, you know, not that that was gonna be guaranteed just because he said it. We understand those things, you know. But uh, he said that I'm gonna, I, I wanna work with this guy. So it, 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 the uh, beginning had begun. The, the, the die was cast. Yeah. And, um, the first camp was ready to uh, I wound up saying yes obviously and we were ready to start the first camp which was one fight before we would know who we were fighting for the heavyweight title yeah was that the training camp in uh, <clears throat> was that the training camp in Palm Springs no it was, that, <clears throat> that was one that was in Jersey but we won that fight on HBO and then bang we got the we got the heavyweight title. Against Holyfield. Uh, against, well, it turned out to be Holyfield because he upset Bo. Yeah. Uh, in the rematch, right? It was the rematch, I believe, uh, uh, where Bo had taken the title from him and then in the rematch with the fan man, that yeah. craziness. Crazy. Uh, Holyfield showed the great warrior that he was and he beat the bigger man and he became heavyweight champ. And so now we're fighting Holyfield instead of Bo. It was going to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. and uh, And then... We had to set up camp, and there was, as you can imagine, there was a lot of turmoil, a lot of turbulence. It wasn't a clear, clear uh, direct flight uh, by any means. But we've, you're right. We went to uh, Palm Springs, uh, the Riviera Hotel. We trained outdoors at the right time there when it wasn't 120 degrees. Yeah. You know? And we trained outdoors on the tennis courts mm -hmm. and where they set it up where fans could come you know, uh, and watch uh, the training, you know, and they put a tent over the tennis courts mm -hmm. and bang. It seems crazy to think of that fans could come in and watch training. Like, it was great. Great for the fans, but I'm thinking if I'm the trainer, I don't want anyone to see what we're working on and what we're trying to prepare for and essentially what our game plan I is. I always had the ability. That's a very good, astute point. That's a very good point. Um, but... I could shut down if I needed to. If I needed to do something more in secret, uh, I could just get there earlier. I could change the time. They, yeah. they thought the time was, say, 1 o'clock every day. Suddenly, oops, we're training at 12. Yeah. yeah and nobody's there. So and, they could watch basic basic training and pad work, but nothing strategic, nothing to do with a fight I, plan. I, they saw some stuff, but uh, only what I let them see. Gotcha. You know? And... Uh, you know, David Copperfield doesn't let you behind that curtain too, <laughs> <laughs> too often, you know. Talk to me about the days prior to the fight because I know they were a bit tumultuous and uh, 
as you mentioned, Michael could be a bit of a uh, head case and wasn't the easiest person. And as the fight but it was starts for these to get, reasons. right, right. So as the fight gets closer, though, these emotions start to like come to the surface. It's a, I can imagine it's a wide range of emotions, yeah. right? Fear, Michael's excitement. Michael's father left him. Everyone left him. His trainers left him because he was crazy. He wouldn't train. They, everyone left him. Allegedly crazy, but you wonder how but much of that was crazy. an act. Exactly. No, it's no, we self know it defense. We He's know pushing it people away. He was a genius. Yeah. Listen, he was just looking. He wanted to find out. People wanted to know about him. He wanted to know about you. Yeah. Nobody stayed with him. Mm -hmm. Are you going to stay with me? Are you going to pass the test? If I'm going to put my ass on the line and do all the things that I got to do in this risky business, are you going to put yours on the line? Well, well, everyone thought it was about, you know, finding out about him. He was doing it to find out about you. But that's a very fine line because I do this with my wife at times. You, I, I almost act like a jerk intentionally to see how much she loves me. And then I realize, like, you, got you, it. you can only push someone so much before they're like, you know what? You win. F this. I'm out of here. I'm unless not putting up with unless this. Unless that someone's been down that road. And there's someone been down that road already. Yep. And... I, but thank God for that, because no, if mean, you listen, push someone enough, they're going to go away. Thank God for him that he came into my life. Yeah. Not just for me. Yeah, yeah. But it was meant to be. But it, um, it was difficult. I was young. But at the same time, I was uh, understanding of what I was dealing with. You know, I... And and again, we he was he was always prodding and and testing and looking to see that if you're going to tell him to take a risk, are you willing to take a risk? If you're telling him to stay, are you going to stay? Uh, everybody had disappeared on him, and so before he was going to buy in, he wanted to know that. He could depend on you. You're, you're looking to see if you could depend on him. He's testing. He was doing his own training procedures and training camp to find out if he could depend on you. Yeah. If he could rely on you to be there. Yeah. And so he would do little things. I, I made a curfew at 10 o'clock. He would test that curfew, but he never broke it because he didn't, because he wanted to do it. He wanted to be stronger. He just wanted to believe that you were going to be strong too. He wanted yeah. to know that you were with him. That's all. But yeah. he would test it. Five minutes, uh, you know, we would make jokes. One of the guys in camp with me, would, with a PR guy, Michael Borman, who was a great guy. He was a PR guy for the Duvers, uh, for main events. He, he would say, there's one thing, you can, there's two things you can be sure of. The sun's coming up tomorrow, and if it's two seconds before 10, Michael Moore is getting in that room. And no matter what, <laughs> no matter what, he, if he's got to run from downtown Palm Springs full speed and, 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 you know, find a, a a shuttle to get him the rest of the way, or or rent a helicopter. He will be in his room by ten o'clock, because <laughs> because he understood there, there was a there was a certain. It, it sounds strange, but uh, there was it was a code. He didn't want yeah. to break of tr of that the trust that that uh, he he didn't want to lose that trust with me. He wanted to keep it. He wanted to test it yeah. and teeter on the, on the fringes of, of of falling off it, but he didn't want to lose it. And then I said, okay, you got to get up and do road work at whatever time I made it. I think 6. It might have been 5.30. But whatever time it was, you got to get up and run. And now if somebody really wanted to cheat, they don't tell you, right? Of course. Right? If you're going to rob a bank, you don't say, hey, at, at 2.40 on Tuesday, I'm going to rob the bank. You just go rob the bank. Well, he would call me up the night before. I'm not. I'm not running to my bum. Hang up. Now, what's that about? And and then now, if I left it in the past, I would have been left alone. You know what would have been told to him? You don't feel like training. That's your backside on the on the line. When you get in the ring, you're the one who's going to pay the consequences. You either way, I'm getting paid. Either way, I'm getting paid. Either way, you you're going to get in the ring. You're not being in shape. Hey. You, that's that's on you, uh, and that would have been the end of it. And and the guy on the other end of the line would have went to bed, but I wound up in his. I would wind up in his room and say, "Hey, he wanted that. He needed that. He needed to know. He needed to know that that 
I cared. He needed yeah. to know that I was going to risk my payday. That's the part of the whole story that I find interesting is the psychology between the two of you. We're gonna we're gonna cut we're gonna wrap this up here on for part one, and we're gonna come back to this next week and finish up with part two of the uh, Michael Mora Holyfield fight. So we just stand up to the